Men of Galilee. She said, whatever he says to you to do, do it. Whatever. 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 Are we really ready for Jesus to say whatever? Huh? Are we ready for that? What if he said to us, like he said to the rich ruler, sell all that you have and give to the poor and come and follow me? Are we ready for that kind of whatever? A lot of the times when we think about that, we have the whatever's worked out in our minds. When this young man came to Jesus, he felt that he was okay. He felt that he had covered all the bases, especially when Jesus said to him, you know the commandments and listed them. And he said, all these, all these I have done. And the Lord said, one thing thou lackest. <laughs> I guess he might have been looking for the Lord to say, um, some light thing but when the lord said sell all that you have he said oh my that's a hard whatever but we want to prepare our hearts so that whatever he saith to us we will do it amen so i want you to find a prayer partner and I want you to agree with that person. And I want you to say to them, whatever God says to us this evening, we're going to do it. Whatever God says to us this evening, we're going to do it. Even if it's very uncomfortable, we're going to do it because we are past the stage where we can just have September to remember, to be tickled and to be thrilled. We're here for life transformation. Amen. So let's talk to God on behalf of each other right now.
Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Can we just lift our hands everywhere and just thank the Lord? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Wonderful Jesus. We bless your name, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Here am I, so unworthy of the blood, unworthy of the blood that sets me free. Oh. Uh -huh. 
praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Be exalted, Jesus. Wonderful Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come, let's magnify the Lord. For He is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, God Almighty. Let's all just bow our heads for prayer now. Oh, hallelujah. Lord God Almighty, you are highly exalted, Lord. You are highly exalted. You are highly exalted. There is none like you, Lord. There is nothing that you can't do. Oh, Lord, 
be magnified in this place. Be magnified in this place. Be magnified in this place. Oh God, we look to you tonight, Lord. From whence cometh our help. We look to you, our great shepherd, our great king, our great rock. We look to you. We look to you, Lord. We look to you. Hosanna. We look to you. We look to you. We look to you, Lord. We look to you. We look to you. Hallelujah. 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 As we enter, Lord, this first night of our September to remember services, we look to you, Lord. We look to you, Lord. We look to you. Oh, God, there is nothing new that we are going to hear tonight, Lord. But we look to you, Lord. We look to you, Lord. We look to you. We are not short, Lord, of hearing messages, Lord. What we are short of, Lord, is responding to what we have heard. What we are short of, Lord, is putting into practice what we have heard. What we are short of, Lord, is making the adjustments that we need to make when we leave a service. So we look to you tonight, Lord. We look to you tonight, Lord. We look to you tonight. We look to you tonight. We don't want these few days just to be days where we can walk away, Lord, and say the messages were good. We are so good at that, Lord, in making commendations about messages. But we look to you, Lord, to change our hearts. Huh? To change our hearts, Lord. To change our hearts. To change our hearts, Lord. To change our hearts. In a way that when you call us, Lord, we will respond to your call. In a way, Lord, that we will respond to what you would have us do. Oh God, we look to you. We look to you. We look to you. We look to you, Lord. We look to you. We look to you. We look to you. Ah, be in the midst tonight, Lord. In a way that only you can. Oh, God, the focus is all about you. Oh, oh, oh. The focus is all on you tonight, Lord. The focus is all on you tonight, Lord. The focus is all on you tonight. And we say thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. And let's all lift our voices together and say in Jesus' name. Let's try that together again in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord, everyone. Amen. Before you take your seats, would you just move around and greet several people as warmly as you can? Amen. Greet several people. Smile with them. If you don't know who they are and if you don't know their name... Ask them. Tell them your name first. Say, I'm so-and-so.
Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. We certainly welcome you this evening to the first night of our uh, September to Remember services. And we want to give the Lord thanks for sparing our lives. Amen. 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 How many are happy to be in the house of the Lord? It's a great blessing to be in the house of the Lord. We want to welcome everyone who, that's here this evening, particularly our guests, our special guests, those visiting with us. If you are here this evening and you are not a member of Pentecostal Tabernacle, would you stand, please? You are not a member of Pentecostal Tabernacle. Oh my. Please don't sit yet. Let's clap our hands. Don't sit, folks. Don't sit. I want all the members of Pentecostal Tabernacle who are sitting near to these persons to take some time I want, I want you to get up from where you're sitting and go across to these precious people and welcome them in a very special way. Thank you so very much for coming. This is really very special for us. Thank you so much. And I see my very good friend, amen, Bishop John K. Hewitt from Bethel, amen. <laughs> Bethel Church of Jesus Christ, Apostolic 20 South Kent Road. And although we are delighted to see him, we are even more delighted to see his dear wife. He always comes, but oh, my Lady Hewitt, you need to stand again. Just turn around so they can see. You. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much for coming. And we have Minister Donovan Brown, just a great friend, just a great friend. Elder, would you just stand so we can see you? Clap your hands for you. Just a great friend and great minister of the gospel. And it's just wonderful to be in the company of these men. Well... You know what? It's offering time. Uh, ushers, would, some, would one of you just run up and receive an offering from the choir? Because they're going to minister during the receipt of the general offering. And while we're receiving the offering from the choir, I'm going to ask Bishop Hewitt to come and to just represent all our guests in greeting us and saying a word for the Lord. And, you know, I, I kind of, when we have September to remember, I kind of just almost, I don't, I don't think I have to send Bishop Hewitt a, <laughs> a letter. It's good to see you, sir. Praise the Lord, saints. That's on week. We can do better than that. Praise the Lord. Praise God. It's always such a blessing to be at Pentab, to be with your pastor and wife and the great team of workers that work along with them and the many saints here and our guests that are with us this evening. Again, happy to have my wife. Here tonight, along with myself, and we have members of Bethel. Stand again, Bethelites. 
Yes. 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 We are not in the body to compete. We are in the body to complete each other. And we have, a, we have a special affinity for Pentab. And we thank God for the relationship that we share, the fellowship that we share. Uh, earlier this year, we, a couple of months ago, we had Sister Bartlett uh, with us in our series, Matters of the Heart. And looking at the different hearts and experiences that we go through. And she made such a beautiful presentation. Oh, yes. Even now, we are still being blessed by that presentation. And just Thursday night, we had Sister Sharon Taylor with us, who addressed this, the seniors. Sister Sharon, I saw you earlier. Stand, please. Yes. Praise the Lord. Say, God bless her. Very powerful presentation to the seniors. So, you know, we share. We share. And we are thankful to God for this kind of fellowship that we have. We are looking at matters of the heart in this September to Remember series, moving out of the ordinary into the extraordinary, because we serve an extraordinary God. If indeed we are his children, then we bear his DNA. Hmm? His divine nature attributes. And as the father is, so should be his children. If we are not bastards, then we should share the same DNA, shouldn't we? Amen. Praise God. So we have always been blessed by the series, the things that we hear. And as the minister who was just praying alluded to in his prayer, we have heard great words. We have heard great messages. The problem is not that we don't know what God wants. It's how to apply. It's the application. How do we move away from this September to Remember series and apply the things that we hear, which is going to make us move out of the ordinary into the extraordinary, because we are special. People of God, apostolics, we are special. We are God's peculiar people. So let's keep the standard high. And let's live in such a way that God will be pleased with our lives. So we congratulate you. And God bless you. We love you. It's just real good to be here tonight. God bless you in Jesus' name. Thank you so much, Bishop Hewitt, and I am so delighted to see all my friends from Bethel. Amen. Amen. And if you are here from any other assembly, don't feel left out. Please, 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 please. You know I, what I say to myself? That I really am not a visitor to any apostolic church. I might not be a member of the church, but if I'm a member of the body of Christ, really I'm not a stranger. Amen. 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 And we should not be strangers. Uh, this evening, all our pastors and ministers and their wives or husbands, we're going to ask you to join us on the first floor of that building over there for just a little, little snack after the service. And the Project Hope will be having a cake sale in the dining room immediately after the service tonight. Of course, our services continue tomorrow and Friday at 6.30 and then on Sunday morning, remember, we start at 9. We don't have Sunday school on Sunday morning. We're starting at 9. Our service starts at 9. 
Amen. No Sunday school. And you can always know the persons who didn't hear because some of them come at 10.15 for morning worship. Those who don't come to Sunday school. Please remember that. And uh, so, brethren, it is very important that we be here at 9 on Sunday. All right, let's stand. We're going to be receiving an offering, and the choir will be ministering during the receipt of the offering. And uh, we're going to ask you just to give as liberally as you can. Uh, don't, don't look in your wallets and purses and pocketbooks and bypass Mr the Honorable Mr. Hugh Shearer. Don't pass him. We don't often see him in church. We don't often see him. He's not a regular member at church services. Um, our other former Prime Minister, Honorable Michael Manley, we do see him from time to time but not as often as we would wish. And uh, we see Nanny. Yes, we see Nanny. Amen. And we, who, who we see? Sangster. We do see the Honorable Sir Donald Sangster. We do see him. Yes, we really do see him. He must have been saved. Amen. And is it Sam Sharp? Sam Sharp? We do see Sam Sharp as well. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And we are happy to see all of them. We're happy to see all of them. Now I... I just want you to give the best offering that you can. Amen? And uh, some of you might have other notes. You might have the queen somewhere. You know, you might have Thomas Jefferson. You know, you might have some of those, Benjamin Franklin and those persons. Amen. Amen. You know, we have some American citizens who are members of Pentecostal Tabernacle. I won't call any names. Praise the Lord. One of them is my good friend, but I won't call her name. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for your many blessings. It is in you that we live and move and have our being. If you had not been on our side, we would have been destroyed a long time ago. Thank you for being a strong tower. Thank you for being a hiding place. Lord, we are going to be giving. We ask you to bless us in a special way this evening. As we give, touch our hearts so that we can give liberally to your wonderful cause. In Jesus' name, amen.
Stand to your feet, everyone. Just worship the Lord. Long as I live, as long as I live, I tell you what, brothers and sisters, as long as we live, even if troubles don't rise, let's run to his throne. Whether troubles rise or not, his throne is the place to be. Amen. I have some very good news. Some very good news. You want to hear it? You sure? I know you want to hear it. On Sunday, we did say that uh, we would not be having... Uh, Pastor Lyndon Johnson with us because of a situation having to do with his wife, but he has called us to inform us that the procedure will not be necessary, at least not now, so from tomorrow night he'll be with us. Amen. Amen. And he'll be with us. Uh, on, Friday, on Sunday morning as well. So tonight, you just have to put up with me for a little while. Amen? 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 And while I'm here, just think about the fact that tomorrow you'll have the person who is supposed to be speaking. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. Of course, our our sub-theme for this week is affairs of the heart or matters of the heart. So we're going to be looking on the inside. We're going to be looking on the inside this week. 
next week, Pastor Gary Ellis is coming and he'll be looking at striving for the mastery. But we're looking at matters of the heart, affairs of the heart. And so we ask you to turn to Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. Good to see our good friend, Brother Keith Hines with us and his dear wife. Brethren, when you don't see Brother Hines, he's, he's not idle. He's very active. And the uh, Lord is helping him in a great area of his work. And we are going to let you know more about that as time goes by. Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. Have you found it? All right, we're going to read responsively. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he, that is Jesus, had answered them well, Asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the scribe said unto him, Well, master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God and there is none other but he. Let's read verse 34 together. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God, and no man after that durst. You know what that word durst means? Huh? What does it mean? Dared not. It, nobody else dared to ask him a question. Amen. Amen. Let's look at Luke chapter 10. You won't be standing for much longer. Luke chapter 10, 25 to 38. And I'll just read that quickly. 25 to 37. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, this is a different scenario. This is not the same scenario. He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. But he, 
willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on, on the other side. And likewise the Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him. So the Levite wasn't as bad as the priest. Eh? At least the Levite looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. You may be seated. Please thank you for standing. Keep your Bibles open. Keep your Bibles open. Keep your Bibles open. Keep your Bibles open. Verse 28 of Mark chapter 12 says, A scribe came to Jesus and asked him, which is the first commandment of all. Now, in asking him which is the first commandment, he was not asking him which was the first of the ten. Or which was the first commandment ever stated. He was asking him which is the most important commandment. That's what this man meant by first. Which commandment is the most important? Which commandment must I keep? that in keeping of it, it will help me to keep all the rest. Now, there, you notice there's no air of hostility in this situation. This man seems to be a genuine seeker of truth, the scribe, genuine seeker of, thru, of truth. And he, he had been listening to Jesus' discourse with the Sadducees. And he, he, he heard Jesus, and he was impressed. And he had this burning question, and he said, this man can help me. I want to know which is the most important commandment in the law. Now, there was, in Judaism, always a great deal of dispute about how to rank the commandments in the Hebrew scriptures in terms of importance, you know there were 613 commandments. 248 positive commandments. And 365 negative commandments. So 248 commandments that said, Thou shalt. And 365 that said, thou shalt not. You can always know when we have to be governed by rules, when there are more thou shalt nots than there are thou shalts. There was a thou shalt not for every day of the year. There was even more debate as to which one was the most crucial of these. Which of these commandments was the tool 
that you could use to interpret all the others. 613, which one was so vital that in keeping of it, you would touch all the others? Because it was difficult to remember 613. Can you imagine? The scribe who posed this question probably had in view the distinction between what we would call ritual laws and ethical laws, or between positive commandments and moral commandments. Now, in the time of Jesus, there was more emphasis placed on the ritual commandments, like circumcision and Sabbath keeping, the rules regarding phylacteries. You know, the phylacteries, the phylactery was a small black cube shaped case containing the texts of the Torah. They were written on parchment. And they were kept in that little case and they wore it. And this was very important for them. Very important. Now, so he asked Jesus, Lord, I really am having a problem. There are 613 commandments. It's difficult to remember them all. Which one? Is the most important. Jesus answered him. The first of all the commandments. And this is now again not first in terms of. Chronological order. But first in terms of importance. I want you to look at your Bibles. Look at. Look at. Mark chapter 12, 29 to 31. Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is here, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. Listen to this. This is the first commandment. And the second. Now the man asked Jesus, which is the first? He didn't ask him which are the first two. He said, which is the first? Jesus says, the second is like namely this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Now why did Jesus give the man two commandments and the man only asked for one? Jesus responds to the man's question by quoting the Shema, Deuteronomy 6. 4 verse 5. That's as close to a Jewish confession of faith as you will find. But Jesus also quoted from Leviticus 19.18 which emphasizes love for one's neighbor. So the scribe asked our Lord what was the greatest commandment in the law. And the Lord responds by combining the Shema in Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5, with Leviticus 19, verse 18, the scribe asks for one commandment. Our Lord responded by naming two commandments. And yet, he refers to them as only one commandment. So now, folks, we have to look at that and, and, and try to figure out what is in the mind of Jesus. Also, in the, second, in the second passage that we read, this 
this man, this other man came to tempt Jesus. And because you notice when the genuine truth seeker came and asked Jesus, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to this man, he, he gave him an answer. But when this trickster comes now to tempt him and ask him, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, you are a theologian. You tell me what the Bible says. So Jesus didn't answer this man. Jesus said, you answer me. You come to mix me up. I go and mix you up. Man says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, you know the Bible. The man says, he quotes the same two passages. He doesn't quote just the Shema. This man knows how to be saved, you know. But he's a trickster. He quotes it, he says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength, and thy neighbors thyself. Jesus says, you have answered right. This do and live. So Jesus is agreeing with the man. In order to inherit eternal life, you can't just love the Lord thy God. You have to love your neighbor as yourself. So, so, folks, really what Jesus is saying to both these men is that the greatest commandment is love. Love to God and love to others. I, I really would like to ask how many in here really believe this? How many believe that this is the great commandment? How many believe that? Put your hands down. How many believe that there is a greater commandment than this? Greater commandment. Which one is it? Which is a greater commandment? Tell me. Which commandment would be greater than love? All right, ask yourself this question. Am I keeping this commandment? Am I observing this commandment? Because this commandment is the way for me to inherit eternal life. That's what Jesus said. This is the way to inherit eternal life. Now let's look at this. Let's look at this. This is very important. What is the first aspect of the great commandment? Well, it starts out by making an affirmation. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Every apostolic ought to know that. The Lord, our God, is one Lord. The, really, what it says is Yahweh, our Elohim, is one Yahweh. Now, it's difficult for me to understand how you can get three out of that. The Lord, our God, is one Lord. Not just one God, but one Lord. And if Jesus is Lord, and there is only one Lord, so that's a powerful statement. That is strict monotheism. Now, if we believe this, 
If we believe that there's only one God, then which other God must we love? Paul's big question, you know, all along was, who is this Jesus? I don't know about this Jesus. I am rejecting these claims about this Jesus, that he's another God. I don't, I am a strict monotheist. And, and this was, Paul, Paul said, you know, I persecuted the church, but I received mercy because I did it in ignorance. When Paul was struck down and heard the voice, Paul said, who art thou, Lord? Now, Paul was a strict monotheist. So when Paul said, who art thou, Lord? Paul was really saying, Yahweh, who are you? What did the voice say to him? I am Jesus. That settled the matter for Paul. That settled it for Paul. Paul as soon as Paul understood who Jesus was, Paul said, what do you want me to do? My problem all along was that I was fighting against you. I didn't understand the concept. But now you have revealed to me who you are. I'm all yours. What do you want me to do? I realize that you are the only God. So I am going to give you my all. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. Touch your neighbor and ask your neighbor how many gods you have in your life. Ask them, is your husband your God? Ask them, is your wife one of your gods? Ask them, is your career one of your gods? You know one of the most, the most subtle form of idolatry is when we become the God of our own idolatry. And because we don't even know. I have met people that are their own God and they don't even realize it. When self becomes God, we are in big trouble. Hear, O Israel, brethren, every morning when I rise to pray, I pray that. I want it to sink deep into my consciousness. I want to understand that there is one God. And most importantly, I want to understand that I am not He. So that. Whatsoever he saith unto me, I will do it. Because he is the creator and I am the creature. So the first thing Jesus challenges us with is, who is your God? Who is your God? Because he's he knows he's going to talk about love. But he knows that a man is going to give the most to the thing he loves the most. And if you love self the most, then you're going to give self the most. If you love your career the most, you're going to give your career the most. If you love Jesus best, So who is my God? Is it my position as pastor? 
Am I giving more to my ministry than I am giving to my God? Shakespeare in his play, Troilus and Cressida, has one of the characters saying this, this mad idolatry to make the service greater than the God. Mad idolatry to make the service greater than the God. Mad idolatry to make the ministry greater than the God. To make the career greater than the God. Ask your neighbor one more time, how many gods do you have? Maybe I can't go further than this tonight. Just right here. But you know it. Some of you know the history. That many years ago now. Maybe. Well certainly over 30 years ago. A gentleman. Attended a. United Pentecostal Church General Conference and heard a message and came to an altar, fell down at the altar. He was already saved, but he fell down at the altar and spent over an hour there and got up from the altar with a song in my heart are kingdoms of a world that's all my own. Kingdoms that are only seen by myself and God alone. In the past, this is a saved man. In the past, when I tried to rule my world, it just seemed to fall apart. So please, Jesus. Be the Lord of all the kingdoms of my heart. You wrote a second verse. You know it. I guess I only fooled myself when I said I had yielded all. For in the secret corner of my heart was a kingdom that did not fall. I surrender now. Make my heart your throne. Rule its kingdoms great and small. For if you are not Lord of everything, then you are no Lord at all. He's only Lord when he's Lord of everything. He's only my God when he's God of everything. Hear, O Israel. The Lord, our God, is one Lord. And so because of that, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. There's nobody else to give it to. See, the pagans had many gods. Gods for different things. And some apostolics have God for different things. And we bow before their altars. We have forsaken the God of Israel, but we have... We're like Solomon. We're like Solomon. Solomon said, okay... We will not forsake the worship of Yahweh. But we can build a temple for Astoreth over here. We can build a temple for Molech over here. We can raise up a shrine for Baal here. The temple is still there. We will come on Sunday. And give Jesus what he should get. But on Monday we'll go to Ashtoreth. But 
ever so often, the words and the melody of the song come to me. For if you are not Lord of everything, then you are not Lord at all. Jesus, I surrender all. Jesus, I surrender all. Jesus, I surrender all. The kingdoms of my heart. So, we can't talk about anything else until we get our first base. And first base is settling the question, who is my God? The fool had said in his heart, there is no God. The bigger fool had said in his heart, there is more than one God. The yet greater fool had said in his heart, there is one God, but he lives as if there are many. Can you tell me what is the practical difference between a man who says the cow is a god and he bows down and worships the cow? What is the difference between him and the apostolic Christian who says Jesus is Lord but Jesus doesn't get his all? It's the same end result. So, brethren, I think the apostolic church and the members thereof have to settle the question, who is my God? Who is my God? Let's lift our hands and worship Jesus. He said to a group of people one day, he said to them, why do you call me Lord and you don't do what I say? He's saying, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do, do, you don't do that. You are, don't call me Lord if you can't obey me. So, some of the pastors who pastor very large churches that some of us love so much, they are saying that Jesus is a way, but he's not the way. And our Lord, I thought he made it very clear. I am the way. The Greek is emphatic. The Greek says, I, in contradistinction to all others, am the way. What Jesus said is, there's no other way except me. I, in contradistinction to all others, am the truth. There's no other truth outside of me. I, in contradistinction to all others, am the life. No other life outside of me. Ask yourself... Who really is my God? How many gods do I have? Is Jesus really Lord in my life? first aspect of the great commandment is thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart 
with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. So we are required to love God with all our faculties. But you can't love God with all your faculties if he's not your only God. It's impossible to love him with all if he's not all. And the way to prove that he's all is not by what I say. It's by how I live my life. Brethren, you know by now that it's too late in the day for us to play with the word. We've just got to give it straight. Take it or leave it. We just have to give it straight. We can't play with this. Heaven or hell is riding on this. We have to tell God's people straight. Amen? We are to love God with our entire being. We are to love God with our whole personality. With all the complexities and depth that pertain to it. First, one will consider as the heart. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. You know that Jesus is not referring to the muscular organ that pumps blood through our circulatory system. The word heart, as it is used here, really is referring to the entire, to the center of the man. Both the rational and emotional elements. It's, it's, it's used figuratively for the hidden springs of personal life. The seat of the affections, emotions, and the will. That's where the game is really decided. So that's where Jesus starts. I need to have that. The heart is the center of our complex being. Physical, moral, spiritual, intellectual. It's the control center. That's where God wants to operate from. That's where God wants to control everything from. The heart. So, so, I, I want to go back to something that I've said before. And I, I, I need for you, I keep having to say this. I want you to listen to what I am saying, not to what you think I am saying. In the Garden of Eden, before the fall, God had Adam's heart. He was in control of the man's control center. And because God was in control, Adam did not have 613 commandments. How many commandments did he have? Huh? One thou shalt not. And that one thou shalt not was not given to him to regulate his life. It was given to prove him, to see if he would obey God or not. After he sinned, then laws had to be applied to govern him from the outside. Because when God can't govern you from the outside, he has to, when he can't govern you from the inside, he has to govern you from the outside. 
That's why eventually Israel had to deal with 613 commandments. And more of them said no than said yes. There were more things that they were prohibited from doing than that they were allowed to do. In the garden, they were allowed everything. Just one prohibition. But once God can't govern you from the inside, he has to govern you from the outside. They, 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 they. So we have to have rules. We have to. No question about it. The weakness with rules is that there are some things that they can't produce. Rules can't produce true holiness. Because True holiness is the product of a love for God. The law can force me to support my wife. So, even if I really don't like her, because I'm married to her, I have to support her. Or the law. If she takes me to court. I'm in trouble. Though. I know I'm speaking. You know I'm just speaking hypothetically. If. If she and I. Were to divorce. She wouldn't really have nothing to get. Because half a nothing is still nothing. <laughs> so I may as well we stay together. <laughs> but even though the law can compel me to support her, the law cannot compel me to love her. No law can do that. No law. No law. But if I love her, I don't need any law. I will support her and give her more than the court recommends. Because I love her. I give her the whole and nothing. <laughs> love, brethren. Love, that's what God wants to engender in my heart. A deep love for him. We used to sing a chorus to open services. I will serve thee because I love thee. Notice. When Jesus dealt with marriage, he said in the beginning, for him, when you talk about life as it should be lived, you have to go back to the garden in the beginning. If you want to know how a man relates to God in the beginning, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Hmm. 
And he says, with all thy soul. Soul refers to the self-conscious life of man. The soul really represents the self. The inward man, the, the, the real personality. The soul is the eye of the individual. It's very hard to distinguish between the soul and the spirit. In fact, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 tells us that really is only the word of God that can distinguish between the soul and the spirit. The writer of the book of Hebrews, I'm reading the New Living Translation, it says, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit. It is the word of God that can divide the soul and the spirit. You can't do it. Listen to this carefully now, brethren. Generally speaking, the spirit is the higher aspect. The soul, the lower aspect. The human spirit. How many in here have the Holy Ghost? Put your hands up. You know that you have two spirits then, right? Do you know that? You have your human spirit and you have the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you just have your human spirit. And there are persons who have their human spirit and from time to, that, to time they introduce from the outside other spirits. Other spirits come in, you have demonic spirits and you have J. Ray spirit you must have passed the taverns and see license to sell spirits you, have, you never see that sign license to sell spirits it's spirits the man not trying to fool you I'm telling you that is a spirit I go and sell you and that spirit can mimic the Holy Spirit. You ever see people who are under the influence of that spirit? People that are under the influence of that spirit. You ever see them walking on the road? They never have a problem with the length. They have a problem with the width. They'll walk for miles, but you see... But let's get back. Ask your neighbor which spirit you have. The human spirit may be recognized as the life principle bestowed on man by God. Without that human spirit, you can't live. In fact, that is what happens when you die is that God, God withdraws. The spirit. Remember that Adam was lying there. Formed out beautifully. But no life. God <laughs> breathed into his nostrils. The breath of life. Now the soul. Listen carefully. The soul may be said to be the life that results from the human spirit. When God breathed his spirit, man became a living soul. It was the spirit that made him a soul. The human body is the material organism which is made alive by the soul and the spirit. Follow me. The soul is the center of the personal being. The eye of each individual life. Listen brethren. The soul is connected to the spirit. Which is man's higher aspect. But the soul is also connected to the body. 
man's lower aspect, the soul is lifted when it is impacted by the spirit. But it is lowered when it is impacted by the body. The person who gives himself up to the appetites of the body is described in the New Testament as fleshly. Your God is your belly. Meaning, this is where you live. This is where we live. I don't want to get too gross. But when you live like that, when you are fleshly, you live by instinct. So you feel like having sex. So anywhere it comes from, you must get it. Feel for this. I, I just go and get it. Fleshly. The individual whose soul is impacted in a positive manner. By the relationship between his human spirit and the Holy Spirit, that person is the person described in the New Testament as spiritual. The individual whose soul rests midway is described as sensual. The sensual person thinks only of self and the interest connected with self. He might not be very vile, you know, but he's wrapped up in self. He may be very refined, may even pose as a Christian. Very cultured. Remember that in the net, that came down to Peter, where all manner of four-footed bees, creeping things and flying fowl, you know. That's a description of the different sinners. You have the flying fowl, the intellectual high sinners. Those people not holding you up with a gun. They're ripping you off by, with books. They're telling you to invest in projects that they know are going to fail. And some of us foolish and invest in it. The sensual person selfish, wrapped up in self. Now, the way to prevent all of this is to love the Lord thy God with all thy soul. All your appetites, all your desires, all your longings. That's how to prevent that. Come under the sway of the Holy Ghost. Some things, brethren, you have to discipline yourself to do. You're not going to feel any anointing. You just have to tell yourself, no, you can't have this. It's not right for you now. You're not going to say Shama or Elo. You're just going to have to tell yourself, no. Must love God with all our self. Bring your degree and your accomplishments and everything to God and say, I surrender them to you. I've given you the glory for them. 
to like Paul, whatsoever things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. I once thought all these things were important. I sat at the feet of Gamaliel. I am a, a, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. No theologian like me. Foolishness. Garbage when I compare it. To the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And I count them as garbage. Like all we are saying, I'm, you know, I'm praying, but it, the Lord just don't make it happen. I'm praying. To be somewhere where someone said to me, you know who I am? But the Lord just won't make it happen. Because I am, you know, I have an answer for them. I'm going to say to them, it depends on what state you're in, you know. Because the Bible says, man at his best state is vanity. And you don't look like you are at your best. So if man at his best state is nothing, and you not at your best, but it just won't happen. Self. Love the Lord thy God with all thy soul, with all of the eye that is in you, so that the eye goes and is replaced by the Jesus. Love the Lord thy God with all thy mind. This Greek word translated mind refers to the faculty of thinking, then of knowing, hence understanding. It refers to moral reflection, a thinking through, a thinking over, a meditation. It also means imagination. My meditation must be on God. I must, my mind must think through why I'm serving God. It can't be just when I come in and feel good. I must think through my salvation. I must love God with my mind, not just with my emotions. I must understand the God that I'm serving. I must understand why he calls me. I must understand that he's more than just for shouting and speaking in tongues. I must love him with my mind. When I think it through. I must say, I, it don't matter what you do to me, you know. I still go and serve you. Because my mind is in love with you. Even when I don't understand fully. You have my mind. I'm going anyway. The Hebrew people. The Hebrew scholars. Listen. The Hebrew scholars. If you read them. They'll tell you. That as far. And, and this, is, this is how they read it. I'm not saying they are right. But they say that Abraham and Job were contemporaries. But God chose Abraham to start the Jewish nation, not Job. And they say there is no doubt that Job loved God with all his heart. But they say Abraham loved God with all his mind. Their reasoning is, that when Job could not understand what God was doing, 
he began to complain and murmur. So why was I born? And began to know, to question the, the justice of God. And whether God really cared deeply what happened to him. But when Abraham could not understand. Take now thy son. Abraham said, I'm still going go. Still going. Still going. My mind is blown, but I'm going to obey you. Not complaining, I'm going. Some of us love God with our emotions, but we don't love him with our mind. So once the thrill is gone, we can't serve him. Once tough time comes, we're gone. Because he didn't have our minds. We came in because we like the music. We like the singing. Or, well, it was just a rough time in my life. My mother just did dead. And I did feel lonely. Yes, that might be a good reason to enter, but it's not a good reason to stay. Because you're not going to grieve over your mother forever. You have to fall in love with Jesus with your mind. Because it might happen that the choir stops singing good. It might happen that the music don't sound so good no more. It might happen that the preacher have a sore throat. Last one we're going to deal with and close. When you think about loving God with your mind, brethren, you realize that our love for God must not be just emotional. It must be rational. Pentecostals need to serve God with our minds so that when the dance is over, we, we, we speak the truth. We can obey God. Our imagination must be centered on God. Some of us have crazy imaginations. We have a fantasy world that is real to us. And we retreat there. But God is not in it. Our minds must come under the rulership of the Holy Ghost. Then we must love the Lord our God with all our strength. This is ref a reference to our bodily powers. If you notice, loving God with all the heart, with all the soul, with all the mind, involves the inner life. Loving him with all the strength has to do now with the exterior life. Strength is about what we can do, about ability, capacity, capability, and powers, gifts, talents. We must love God with all of that. Whatever ability you have, whatever talent, love God with all of it. Love God with all of it. That's why you can't be a gospel singer and a rhythm and blues singer. You have to love God with all of it. Folks, it has never worked because it can never work. You can't sing gospel and sing anything else and remain a gospel singer. It never happened. And the devil don't even have to change. Him just, we're so foolish because we think we will, will be different. Listened to a program many years ago. And this gentleman knew his stuff. He, he knew music very well. And he said, he, he said, the, the, the night before, the, the week before, he said, 
I'm going to try and find a song by Mahalia Jackson. That's not a gospel song. And he came back the following night, the following week, and said, I found one. So I said, boy, I have to listen to this one, because I know this lady. So he began to play the song. It's a song that used to be sung at weddings. Because you come to me with not save love. A wider world of hope and joy I see. Because you come to me. Listening to the song, I know the song. Because God made thee mine. I cherish thee through light in darkness, through all time to be, and pray his love will make our love divine, because God made thee mine. Let me say, that is a secular song. No, man, brethren, you can't mix love for God and love for the world. Your talents must be used to serve God. Paul told... One of the things that we have to grapple with in our theology is that Jesus and Paul came to a world where slavery existed and they said nothing about it. Everybody looking at me strange now. Paul said, slaves, don't rebel against your master. Serve them as you serve God. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but doing the will of God from your heart. You're working for this man as a slave, but really you're doing it as unto the Lord. So your talents that are blessing this man's business, you're doing it for God. Before I came to the church, I was working at a place, and I told the manager one day, The reason why you can treat me a certain way is because I'm really doing all that I'm doing in this company here for God. All our talents, all our abilities must be used for God. We must love God with them. Even when they are employed in secular activities, we must do it as unto God. And if you can't do it as unto God, you can't do it. And because we are so constituted and people want a rule for everything, people come and ask you strange questions about what they can do. And my rule of thumb is, the Bible says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all for the glory of God. So if you can watch pornography for the glory of God, watch it. Why are you coming to ask me if you can watch it? Glorify God, man. If you can sing, if loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. And glorify God. Sing it. The church needs to start loving Jesus best of all. That's, that's, that's where we need to to be brethren. We, we need to, to start loving God. And the, the more I love God. Is the less my pastor has to tell me what to wear. Where to go. Who to talk to. The more I fall in love with Jesus. Because sometimes you have to make up your own rules. I'm going to close with this. There was a group of P 
people that lived in the Old Testament times. In Judah, by the name of the Rechabites. The Rechabites, their ancestor was Jonadab. And Jonadab said to them, this is how we go and live our life. We're not going to drink any wine. We're not going to drink any strong drink. We're not going to even eat grapes. No, the Bible never tell them that they couldn't do that. They said, boy, that's our rule for ourselves. The Lord said to Jeremiah, take these men into the temple. Carry them in a secret compartment. Where's only you alone and them. And give them wine to drink. They wouldn't be breaking any biblical commandment, you know. No biblical commandment they would be breaking. The Rechabites said, no, Jeremiah. Because our father told us we should not do that. And from he told us that we don't do it. And the Lord said, and if, if you don't get this, you miss the point of it. The Lord says, see, the children of Rechab, they hold to what their father tell them. But my people don't hold to my word. How many want to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength? Let's stand. We need a church that loves Jesus only. We need a church that is in love with Jesus. We need a church that, gr that has grown up. We need a church that is mature. That God can start revealing some things to us. So that we can, the writer of the Hebrews say, I want to move away from the principles of the doctrine. I want to stop talking about baptisms. I want to stop talking about that. Not that it's not important, you know. But you can't live there. How long we must be arguing about that? I want to tell you about Melchizedek and I can't tell you. Paul said to the Corinthian church, I want to give you some meat, but you can't bear it. You're still drinking milk at 40. So we can't move. Because we are stuck in one place, fighting over the same thing all along. Big reason is we just can't love God with all our heart. And if you don't mind sharp, we go to hell over things that Jesus never got Calvary for. And the things that you and Calvary for, we don't even start to talk about them. Lift your hands and worship God. Anybody in the building today want to say, Jesus, I want you to be my only God. I want to tear down every other idol that's on your throne and install you as the only God. The first God I'm going to move is self. When take the idol of self out the way, you're going to be my God. That's the first thing I'm going to check. Who is really my God? And how many gods I have? And when I eliminate all the other gods, then I'm going to channel all the love I have inside me and the one God that I really want to serve. See, brethren, if 
if self is your God, every little petty thing will hurt you and move you out of the kingdom. But if God is your God, you will be hurt and move on. If you're in the church and you don't expect to be hurt, just go back out in the world. Because you're in the wrong place. And anywhere you go, any church you go, you're going to be hurt. Because people are people everywhere. You have liars in every church. And you don't even have to look around to find it. Just look in the mirror, you might find one. Why, why you laugh? I heard a preacher preaching on the TV. I know him well enough. And he said, people tell me they don't want to come to this church because a lot of hypocrites come here. And he said, it's true. A lot of hypocrites come here. But he said, still come because God can take one more. Because you are not all that and a bag of chips. You can't fool me. Beating in your heart is a heart of flesh. You never have the Holy Ghost from your mother's womb. You have a sinful nature. Lift your hands and worship God. We need Jesus to be king. How many want Jesus to be king? We're not going to ask you to come to the altar tonight. If you really want to come, you can come. If you feel a need to come to the altar and pray, you can. But we're not really giving an altar appeal. If you want to, you can come. But I want you to just close your eyes. And I just want you to say to yourself, I need to check to ensure that Jesus is the only God in my life. Just need to check to ensure that Jesus is the only God in my life. Hallelujah. And if I've settled that and he's the only God, then let me check if I love him with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. And a pretty, pretty sound way to do that is just to check if I'm obeying his word. If I'm not obeying his word, something is wrong with my love. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Not just the word that I like, by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So folks, we, what we want here is not a mega church. We want a church of people that are ready for the rapture. Because Jesus is coming soon. And, and if, if you want to be ready for the rapture, just love God with all your heart. Turn to somebody and tell them, help me pray tonight. I need to love God more. Tell them I desperately need to love God more. Tell them maybe I love myself too much. Some of us have hardened our heart against the word of God because we just love self. Hold the person's hand and say, pray with me for a minute tonight. Ask God to help me to love him with all my heart, with all my soul, 
I need to love him with my personality. I need to love him with my mind. I need to set my affection on Jesus. That fantasy world that I've created, I need, I need to pull down that stronghold tonight. That world that I'm living in, that's not really real. need to get rid of it tonight. The things that I put in front of God. I say I love God, but when it's time to respond, I come up short. Because I really don't love him as much as I should. We don't even get to touch love thy neighbors thyself. Some other time. But we're going to pray tonight. If you feel like praying by yourself, that's all right. I don't have a problem with that. Just maybe say to the person, you know what? I just feel like I need to talk to God for myself tonight. But if you don't mind praying with somebody, say to them, I kind of need your help, you know. Kind of need your help. I'm not doing so well by myself. Some other things coming in. Talk to Jesus. Come on, talk to Jesus. Whether you're praying with somebody or you're praying by yourself, talk to Jesus before we go through the doors.